Well, good morning. It is good to see y'all. I've missed y'all. It's been a while since I've been up here. Uh, but we're just going to jump right into things this morning. We're going to be in Psalm 63. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there, turn there now. If you do not have a Bible with you, our ushers are coming down the aisle. You can just throw a hand in the air. Uh, and we would love to give you a copy of God's Word. We believe it is just that. It is His words to us. And if you do not own a copy of God's Word, you do now. That is yours. We would love for you to keep that. Uh, we love you, and we're glad that you're here. Well, this morning we're going to be talking on the topic of fear, particularly when it comes to uh, when we go through times that are referred to in Scripture as the wilderness, times that are hard, times that are heavy, times that uh, are at times crushing even. And we get to see in a time where David, King David, the man after God's own heart, the mighty warrior, when he comes into a time of absolute fear, we get to see his response. And it is my hope that you would come back to this passage when you go through the wilderness. I know that I will. Because the reality when it comes to the wilderness is that you will go through it. If you are not in it now, you will go through it. And that may not seem hopeful. We're gonna talk about the hope that we have here in a moment. But what I, I wanna be clear with you this morning. If someone has preached to you a gospel that says, because you are a Christian, you will never go through hard times, you will never go through pain. That is a false gospel. You will. But the difference is that we now have a hope. We have hope in a God who brings purpose from pain. We have hope in a God who is not just in the sky somewhere holding a snow globe that we're all inside of. We have a God who's close, a God who is near, a God who is near to the broken hearted, near to those who are hurting. I'm excited to dig into that together this morning. Let me pray for our time and we will jump right into it. God, we thank you. For that fact, we thank you that you are a God who is near. You are not a God who is distant, not a God who, who has deserted us. You're a God who's close. You call us to draw close to you. So God, I pray this morning as we talk about fear, specifically as we talk about the wilderness, these tough times, these hard times that we will go through. I pray that we would be reminded of your truth in the midst of those times, reminded that you are a God who is close and who loves us with a steadfast love. We thank you for the God that you are. We thank you for that steadfast love. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Well, I remember my first time to really dig into this passage, Psalm 63, and it was kind of a unique experience, and, and it goes a little bit farther back. So it goes all the way back to my time first starting at Faithbridge, which is crazy enough, coming up on two years ago, and uh, I, to say it was a quick transition is a little bit of an understatement. I was in a, a, a job before, and I ended that job on a Sunday, and then came to work at Faithbridge on a Monday, and then it was just go, go, go from there. Right, and I loved it, it was fantastic, but I started to notice something as the year went on. I started to notice I wasn't sleeping a whole lot. I started to notice I'm starting to get a lot of headaches. I'm sick all the time, like what is going on? And uh, so I brought this to my mentor. Uh, for the sake of the story, we'll call him Ken Werlein. <laughs> and just backstory, character, uh, founder of Faithbridge. And so I tell him, and I hadn't been to the doctor in a while, admittedly. And he said, I think you need to go to the doctor. And I was like, I think you need to go to the doctor. <laughs> Waited until he walked away. 
So I go to the doctor and I start telling her my symptoms, right? What, what's going on, the lack of sleep, the headaches all the time. And she then pulls out a piece of paper and at the top, it says symptoms of high stress. And uh, yeah, she tells me, hey, I want you to circle all of the symptoms that you may be feeling. So when I circled the page and handed it back to her, <laughs> she said, I think you have high stress. And I said, I have high stress. And she said, you have high stress. I said, I can have high stress. She said, you could have high stress. I was like, I have high stress. She was like, you have high stress. So I took this news to my mentor. And I was like, I have stress. <laughs> and he said, stop shouting. <laughs> but what I want you to do, that's, that's a reality. Okay, and the, and the job that you're in now, you are going to have to intentionally seek times to rest. Fun fact, I'm not good at that. So he gave me a very clear way to do that. He said, I want you to go on a private retreat. I want you to go somewhere intentionally far away by yourself and have no communication with anyone else. I was like, my mom used to send me on those all the time. That's no big deal. <laughs> and honestly, at first I was like, okay, I, I'm new to this like church ministry thing. This is different to me. And so I was like, oh, so it's like a sabbatical. And he was like, no. <laughs> what I want you to do is I want you to go on this three-day retreat. I want you to turn your phone off, and I want you to journal and process through the past year and spend some time with the Lord. I was like, okay. Okay. I can do that. So I reached out uh, to a very loving, very generous uh, family that I am friends with who owns a great property. Uh, it is a ranch house and it is awesome. There's like 10 bedrooms that you can sleep in. There's a pool, right? There's a jacuzzi, there's a grill. I don't know how to use it, but there was one there. <laughs> and all of these fantastic things and it's awesome. And, and, and I get there and I remember just like going around like, this is amazing. Like I knew I was going to be by myself, but this is awesome. Like, I, do I want to sleep in this bedroom? Like, do I want to sleep in this bedroom? Do I want to just set an alarm every two hours and just change beds? Because I can't. I'm on sabbatical. I can do whatever I want. And, uh, and, and, and it was fantastic, but there was a part of it that nobody really warned me about. Because it's all great, right? I'm jumping on the beds. If you're watching, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I'm, I'm swimming in the pool. I'm pretending like I know how to cook steak. I'm doing all this stuff and it's fantastic. And then the sun goes down. Like it had every day for the past 27 years of my life. But I had never really noticed it until this moment. Because the sun is this thing that illuminates light in the sky. And when it goes down, this beautiful 10 bedroom Lots of acreage ranch house goes from a retreat to the beginning of every scary movie I've ever seen. <laughs> and I will tell you in vulnerability that there are really three different stages to, to this fear. The first is you just start to think a little more, right? You just start to become aware of the fact, okay, I'm in a ranch house with a lot of acreage and if somebody wanted to kill me, this is a prime location for that. And all of those 10 bedrooms to sleep in now become 10 hiding spots for a murderer. <laughs> and you start looking around. But then the next stage of fear, you start to have a, a, a little bit of, of kind of delusion. You start to kind of verbally process more. You even start to have conversations with the assailant that may or may not even be there. Where you're like, hey, I know you're here. So just come on out. As if the person's gonna be like, dang it, and walk out. And then the last stage, you're just done, right? You're like, I've been hiding for hours, maybe even days. 
I can't do this anymore. And you drag a chair in the middle of the living room and you're like, here I am, bring it on. If you're gonna do it, just do it now. And by the end of it, you're just exhausted. And, and I remember getting to that point, I was just, all of this fear, I'm exhausted. And I was just like, I've gotta get to bed, but that's also the problem because I don't wanna move from this spot that I'm in. And then, beacon of light at the end of the hallway, the light that I left on earlier that day. And I remember thinking, thank goodness I'm the most irresponsible person that I know. (laughs) And so I go to the kitchen and I grab a pair of tongs to protect me. (laughs) It was frustrating because I had to move the knives out of the way. (laughs) And I remember thinking, just get to the bedroom. And so I I sprint and I run for it. I get to the bedroom. I slam the door closed. I slide down. I'm like, I've done it. I did it. And then I see next to the bed, there's a tiny desk. And my mind immediately goes back to the reason I'm here in the first place. That I have been given direct instructions, encouragement to sit down to journal, to process through the past year and to spend time with the Lord. And I will be honest, I did not want to. But as I sat down and I spent time in the word, I spent time in Psalm 63. What's interesting about Psalm 63 is the context behind it. And the context behind it is that David, King David, the mighty warrior, the man after God's own heart, is on the run, and not just from anybody, he's on the run from his own son, Absalom, who wants to dethrone him. And just to make it clear, that doesn't mean I'm gonna gather people together and we're gonna vote you out. It's not a democracy, I'm coming to kill you. David has sent the people that he's with back. He is, a, he is completely alone, he's isolated, fearing for his life. And then he pins Psalm 63. And as I read it, the more I spent time in it, I felt peace start to come over me. Let's look at that together. Psalm 63, verse one through eight, the very words of David when he is in a very literal and figurative wilderness. He says, oh God, you are my God, earnestly, I seek you, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary beholding your power and glory because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, refuge, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. We see really three things from David himself, from the words that he pins down that are very, very clear and very, very relevant to us when we do go through that time of being in the wilderness, when we go through that that hard season. And the first is this. The first is that no one is above emotion. No one is above emotion. I believe that that we as humans are are afraid of really two things and that's feeling and failing. Sometimes feeling more so. But no one is above it. That's why somebody like Charlie Chaplin, a legend in comedy, one of the most iconic faces in comedy. 
from the black and white films. If you've seen the wind blowing his hat off, you see him tripping on a cane. Charlie Chaplin, the legend of making people laugh. That's why that same guy, Charlie Chaplin, who says a day without laughter is a day wasted. That's why the same guy who says you can't find a rainbow if you're looking down is the same guy who says I like to walk in the rain because no one can see when I'm crying. That hits home with me. The funny guy. I have a tendency to want to mask my pain. And I wonder how many of us spout off the credentials for why we can't embrace and and confront the realness of the emotion that we have when we're in the wilderness. I'm, I'm the father I'm supposed to be the the stronghold. I don't have time for feelings. But you've been jobless for three months. You've been suppressing the emotion for just as long. I'm the mom, right? I'm the glue of the family. My family needs me. I I don't have time to process my own feelings and my own emotions in this. But your own mom is back in the hospital and not getting any better. For me, when my family went through a wilderness. I'm going to talk about this in the moment. I wanted to be the rock. I didn't have time to confront the emotion. My family needed me. We live in a culture that tells us to suppress our feelings and conquer them. But they were meant to come up. In short, it is okay to not be okay. But now, when we do confront the realness of the emotion, what do we do with it? And that brings us to the second truth, which is when you do confront this emotion, where you place your fear is key. Where you place your fear is key. It is, it, is, it is no news to us that we like to be in control. We want to be in control. If you were here for Ash Wednesday, you heard this, but if not, allow me to explain it to you. We, 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 we like to have this sense of control. This is why some of us enjoy haunted houses and some of us don't. If you do like haunted houses... I don't understand you as a person. (laughs) But for you, it's fun, right? Why is it fun? Because it's all just a game. It's all a gig. It's all pretend. None of this is real. I still have a sense of control. And if you're like me, and the six foot eight clown jumps out into the hallway, you don't make the cognitive response that that's just a 40-year-old guy named Dwayne making part-time. <laughs> that's a real clown. <laughs> this is all real. I am not in control right now. That is why if you scare me during the work week, I am from Baytown, Texas, and you will catch these hands. We like to be in control, and fear comes when we realize that we're not. So the question is, when you're completely out of control, do you panic and internalize, or do you proclaim it and give it away when fear is placed in the trustworthy hands of God, fear is relinquished in the form of trust? And trust produces peace. See, it's cool because that's, that's, that's what David is doing after he's confronted his, his emotion and, and, and confesses that my, my flesh faints, my soul thirsts. It's parched as in a dry and weary land. After he's done that, he begins praising. And he begins praising by declaring truth. 
Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. What does he say? I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, that is a powerful sign of refuge and protection, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. He's praising by proclaiming truth. And here's the thing, when you're in the wilderness, the only way that the enemy can have a foothold is if he gets you to believe a lie. That God is not good. That God is not faithful. The only way the enemy can have a foothold is if he gets you to believe a lie. Truth has already won. We acknowledge that on Easter with the cross, through what Jesus did, the cross that was seen as a brutal torture device for, for penalty and for punishment is now seen as a sign of victory. So the question is when the fear creeps in because you're out of control, where does your mind, your inner being, your soul, where does it go? Does it retreat and hide in the inconsistent, porous shield of your mind or does it immediately go to the refuge of a powerful, big, in control and close God? And here's what I'll say about praise. Praise doesn't just happen as an end result when you're on the other side of the wilderness. Praise happens in and through the wilderness. It's cool because what else David is doing here is he's remembering. He says, for you have been my help. He's reminding himself of the times that God has carried him through the wilderness and brought purpose to times of fear, to times of pain in the hard seasons. For you have been my help. He's reminding us of a very important truth that your wilderness is your equipping. God is equipping you for something that he will call you to. You see, this isn't David's first time in this wilderness, in the wilderness in general, of course, but this specific wilderness that he's in, he's in the wilderness of Judah. Again, fleeing from his own son, who, who's coming to kill him, but the last time that he was in this wilderness, he was a shepherd, caring for a flock. When a lion and a bear approach, he has to learn to fight, to defend a flock, to defeat an enemy that is much greater, much bigger, than he is that wants to destroy him. The same skill set he would later use when he defeats the mighty giant Goliath. What I would say to you is remember the times that God has brought you out of the wilderness. Remind yourself of those times. This is my dad. His name is Lynn. He's my stepfather, but I called him dad because he became that. When I was seven years old, he chose my mom, but he also chose me. Very powerful, clear picture of the gospel for myself. And I'll admit, we butted heads a lot growing up. There's a lot of bitterness that we both harbored just didn't see eye to eye, we had butt heads all the time. A lot of weight that I carried with me a lot of my life and it wasn't until I was in college that after another argument, at the end of it, we had completely reconciled. Years of bitterness and hurt was just gone. I can't even tell you how it happened other than the Lord. 
a week later, almost to the date, he was working in his garden. And as he was digging, he couldn't dig anymore because of a pain in his stomach. We went to the doctor to find out that he uh, had been diagnosed with stage four cancer. And initially the diagnosis was that he would have three to five years, that's a healthy expectancy for us, three to five years to live. When they went in and did surgery, it went down to one to two. And in five months, he had gone to be with the Lord. That is one of the most tangible wildernesses of my life. And I remember honestly thinking, (laughs) how in the world does God bring purpose from this? And fast forward to my summer working at a camp, at a family camp where the whole family comes. And I remember specifically one kid (laughs) who was having the worst week of his life. He was having a terrible time. And he wasn't laughing at any of my jokes. And I remember being so frustrated. I was like, do you know where you're at? Like, this place is amazing. This is so much fun. Like, what is going on? Why are you just trying to make everything so difficult? Why are you trying to make everything hard? And then one day I saw him sitting off by himself on the ground. I hate sitting on the ground. I sat next to him. And I asked him, what is the deal? (laughs) What's going on? He said, I don't know if you've noticed but my dad that usually comes with us to family camp is not here anymore because I lost him in December. And in that moment, I got to look at him and I got to say, I lost mine in October. And in that instant, the walls went down. And it may seem so small But in that moment, I saw a glimpse of the new purpose that I had. The new purpose that was brought from one of the most painful experiences of my life. I now had a way to connect with people who had gone through the same wilderness that I did not have before. I now had a purpose to declare to people who have a step-parent relationship that they just don't see eye to eye on. And I realize that for some of you, there is some serious trauma that goes along with it. It may go deeper than that. But for the ones who are just like, we're just not seeing eye to eye and who are thinking and contemplating, is it even worth it to just reconcile with it? I get to say to them, it's worth it. And I experienced the love of God (laughs) the steadfast love of God, the closeness of God in a way that I had never experienced in my life. The truth is, I would have never in a million years asked to go through this. But I would never change how it happened. When my dad was given his initial diagnosis, he was quiet for a moment. And then he used a phrase that at first was confusing and then was powerful. He said, either way, I win. He was on to something here. It reminded me of the truth of the gospel, that it is not just about our time here on this earth. The gospel goes far beyond our time here on this earth. And it immediately reminded me, when Jesus is at the table with his disciples, about to go to the cross, this torture device, about to absorb the wrath of God that was meant for us, and rightfully so, he tells them that they're gonna go through the wilderness, that they're gonna go through hard times, 
He tells them that it's coming, it's inevitable. But then he says to them a phrasing. He says, take heart, for I have overcome the world. And in the Greek, this phrasing is tharseo, take heart. It means to have courage. The gospel goes far beyond our time here on this earth. The reality of the matter is that when we remind ourselves of the truth of the gospel, when we remind ourselves that we have a loving God with steadfast love who is close to us, when we remind ourselves of the time that he has brought us through the wilderness, we no longer become a people who live in fear. We become a people who live in hope. What I will tell you this morning is that my heart breaks for the people in our community, our nation, our world, who are in times of wilderness, hurt, pain, and do not know this same hope. This is why we go. This is why we are sending students, families, to go proclaim this truth, this hope, this gospel, this free gift of spending eternity with the very one who created us on purpose. And what I would say is what an opportunity for us to proclaim the same hope when we leave here today. We as a church get the exciting opportunity to commission these goers who are ready to go proclaim that hope, who are ready to go proclaim that truth. My heart is beating right now thinking about that. I'm gonna pray for us and then we'll get to do that together. Let me pray. God, we thank you that you are a God who again is not distant. You are a God who has not deserted us. That even though we, we go through times that are tough and we will, because even though you've offered us forgiveness, even though you've offered us redemption from death to life, we still live in a temporary world, a temporary home that is broken and is not yet redeemed. But God, we have a hope that you bring purpose from pain. We have a hope that you are close. You dwell within us, around us. God, I pray for these goers who are gonna go proclaim that truth that hope of a a God who has steadfast love for his creation. God, we love you. We thank you for that steadfast love. We pray all this in your name. Amen.